Hebrews 11 honors the champions of faith who wandered in deserts and in mountains and caves of the earth. Because of this cloud of witnesses, we can run with patience the race that is set before us. Shalom, hello again, welcome to our new series. It's on faith. And you know, I've heard it said, uh, why, is, why isn't there a chapter in the Bible on faith? There really is. Hebrews 11 is what we're gonna cover in this series, and that's about faith. The essence of faith, the uses of faith, the examples of faith. Uh, faith is the sureness, the hope of things that we don't see. Or to put it in, in the scriptural words, in uh, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. The Old Testament personalities, by means of this faith, uh, served God well. And then the chapter goes on and it illustrates uh, how the Old Testament personalities did this. You know, it says, by faith, the universe was formed by God so that things that are seen are made of things that are not visible. That is what it says in uh, the third verse. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. When I was in Campus Crusade, the teacher stressed how we have discovered only recently the molecular, the atomic theory, and we really have found out that literally the things we see are made up of things we can't see. Uh, I don't think with our best electron microscopes we've ever really seen an atom. We, we've seen how atoms act and how they perform. But uh, the things we see out in life, a chair, a, a building, a person, are made of these things which are not visible and we can never see. Uh, it's a very interesting reference from an ancient source, imagine, to the atomic theory. Well, the chapter goes on from there, commending certain personalities. It uh, goes to Abel, by faith he offered unto God uh, a better sacrifice. You know, he was commended for his righteousness because he gave the blood, he sacrificed a lamb. And this chapter points out that Abel's blood still speaks to us by faith. By faith, Enoch was taken up. He didn't die. It, it says he had no death. He is one who pleased God and was taken up in translation, a type, an illustration of the church, which shall be directly translated to God. Perhaps Enoch is one of the two witnesses we read about in Revelation 11, who uh, evidently still have a mission to do in the end times. Uh, perhaps one is Enoch and one is Elijah, because those two personalities did not die on earth. They were taken up by God. And yet the scripture says, uh, it is appointed unto each man once to die. So those two men have not died yet. It's only a theory. They may be the two witnesses. Others say the witnesses will be Moses and Elijah because the two witnesses do miracles that those two personalities did. I'm not insisting on it, but it's very interesting that Enoch, uh, like uh, Elijah, was translated. And it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He rewards those who seek him. Then the example of Noah is given. I'm not covering every personality given, but Noah is, is given a commendation for building the ark. My goodness, what an example of faith. Uh, it had never rained. Talk about works. Uh, uh, Noah is, is convinced of the Lord's warning of the flood, and he begins to build a boat, a ship, an ark. <laughs> People say, what are you building? And, and, and even when it's finished, having no idea what it is. Uh, ridiculing him all the way as, as he did this work by faith. Then by faith, uh, Abraham changed countries. 700 miles or so he came from Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan, Canaan, uh, we say in Hebrew. And uh, there he uh, offered Isaac in sacrifice. Talk about an act of faith. He was absolutely prepared to kill his son, his only begotten son uh, with his wife, Sarah who uh, God had promised 
would continue the covenant. He had to believe that God would resurrect Isaac from the dead and still he was willing to sacrifice him by faith. And by faith, Isaac gave the blessing to his younger son of the twins. He gave it to Jacob and not Esau. That was God's will. Uh, by faith, he dug wells. He was the well digger. He, he prepared the land for people after him. He's the first born Jewish person. Imagine being uh, <laughs> convinced that a country belongs to your people, but you're the only one. You're the only person of the Jews and, and that's your country. And yet I'm standing in a Jewish country in Israel today. Isaac had the faith to believe that then when he was virtually alone here. By faith, Moses saw God. Imagine, he is the only man who ever saw God. He beheld Almighty God. He covered his face with a veil. He led the Exodus by faith, 40 years in the wilderness. And by faith, Joshua and Rahab, uh, believed in the land and the promises that the Jews would occupy this Canaan and call it Israel. And, and <laughs> the two of them, you know, Joshua was one of the uh, spies who went in at Kadesh Barnea early in the Exodus and estimated that the, the Hebrew nation could take that land. Uh, ten spies said, no, you, you couldn't. But Joshua and Caleb said, yes, you can uh, with God's help. And uh, uh, he believed in the land. Rahab, the harlot of Jericho, uh, a Gentile woman, a, a mediocre woman, but she said, looking the Jews in the face, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. Oh, that, that the Gentile people of today would be able to open their mouths and say, I know that the Lord hath given the Jews the land. And the New Testament personalities aren't mentioned. This book is Hebrews written in the New Testament to the Jews who are reading the Old Testament. So it covers Old Testament personalities, but we could as well uh, go on with Paul's suffering for the faith. My goodness, he spent many a night in jail. He was whipped. He was run from place to place. He suffered a great deal for the faith. And Stephen, uh, the first martyr, a stone to death and yet testifying as he died to the faith. Uh, these people made their faith really count for something, and it counted with God. And Abel gathered stone from the earth to build an altar to Jehovah. He brought kindling and lit the sacrificial fire. As he tended his flock, he thought of what he could offer unto the Most High God that would be worthy. What should it be? The God of the universe had formed the world and everything in it. Everything in the heavens and on the earth came from God. Abel's brother Cain would offer the fruit of the ground, but Abel would give his most precious possession, the best that he had. The herdsman searched his flock and chose one spotless and without blemish to give glory and honor to God. And the Lord, who walked in the garden with Abel's father Adam, looked upon Abel's heart and found it good. The shedding of blood would be acceptable in God's sight. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man. When God spoke well of this sacrificial offering. Well, as its first example of faith in action, Hebrews 11 presents the story of Abel, and I think we all know that story. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And the point is made very, very quickly that it is the blood that God wants for remission of sins. Uh, Leviticus 17:11, uh, uh, I've given you the blood for remission of sins. And uh, uh, right off in Genesis, we see the principle. Genesis is the book of firsts, first things. And uh, we saw the first sin when uh, Eve ate of the fruit and she gave it to Adam and God said, Adam, 
you know, what happened here. And he said, it was the woman, not just that, but it was the woman you gave me. Uh, trying to uh, shift the blame back to God. That was man versus God. And with uh, Cain and Abel, we have the first sin of man versus man. They're brothers, of course, but the first death uh, results from the, the, their first act of worship. Uh, Abel, uh, it's a bigger point being made. He was in a right relationship with God. He understood what God wanted. And, and uh, God had cursed the ground, and, and yet uh, uh, Cain gave of the ground. A Abel's sacrifice uh, had the blood, and uh, this is later proved perfect in the Bible as a sacrifice. But the first murder results from uh, Cain's choice and God's preference. And you know, the principle always continues then in history. Cain people always kill able people, so to speak. The world is made up of, if you think of it that way, people who like Cain cannot believe in God and cannot do God's way of things and, and uh, of able people who do believe in God and who have faith. Uh, look at the world versus the church in, in every generation. Uh, you have uh, worldly people versus the religious people. Look at, uh, in our time, Islam uh, versus uh, Israel, uh, as, as though the presence of a relative handful of uh, Jewish people in the Middle East is, is interrupting the progress of 21 or 22 Arab uh, dictatorships. And yet uh, the animosity goes on and on, a religious kind of animosity, Cain people versus able people. Uh, the media versus Israel, an, an insane bias that continues and continues, uh, uh, the preference of, uh, of, of, of a uh, dictatorship over a democracy, uh, the, the preference for a police state over, over a, uh, a, uh, an ally of the United States and so on, and the media continuing. It is Cain versus Abel all over again. Uh, you know, when the Lord encountered the Samaritan woman, you had an interesting a uh, worldly person versus Messiah himself in, in, a, in a discussion. And that is a most interesting discussion. You know, the Samaritan woman tries to involve the Lord in uh, theological tangles. Uh, she says, we've always worshiped in this mountain uh, where our father Jacob was. And, and you say, you Jews say, in effect, she's saying to, to Jesus, uh, that we should worship in Jerusalem. And he answers her in a most powerful way. She says in John 4:20. Uh, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. That's an interesting statement, and it's a, there's another whole program in that one. But uh, when God chooses uh, disciples or apostles or prophets, he chooses Jews. And in the tribulation period to come, he'll choose 144,000 Jewish people to testify. And so it goes through history. You know, uh, Jesus gave her a perfect witness in John 4.10. He says to the Samaritan woman, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, they were, of course, at, at the well at, at Sychar. Thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. That is the, the Christian ideal in one verse. First, you need to know the gift of God. You need to understand what salvation is and who it is that says, give me to drink. In other words, you have to know what person to go to for your salvation. In this case, of course, the Messiah. Then thou wouldst ask of him, we must ask individually for this salvation, not good enough to be baptized as a baby, not good enough to attend a church that says it's the correct one. We must ask for our salvation of Jesus Christ, and he would have given thee living water. It's free, it's simply given when asked for. And that is what uh, Jesus told the Samaritan woman on that occasion. Like Abel, by faith, we choose the right sacrifice when we choose Jesus. The answer to the age-old question, what about the heathen? What about the, 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 the Jew, the, the Muslim, the, the good man? He needs the right sacrifice. 
uh, not to be subservient to some priesthood, not to be subservient to some conference of churches, not subservient to doing works, not subservient to keeping laws, not subservient to the land of Israel, not subservient to false prophets or false Christs, which are signs of these end times, but to come to Jesus Christ by faith. Walk down the Mount of Olives. Sail across the Sea of Galilee. Ride to the summit of Masada. Float in the Dead Sea. Find the treasures of Petra. Tour the Holy Land with Zola Levin. You know, when you see Israel on the news, they usually represent it with dusty streets and small villages and so on. But the Israel in our tour spots or the Israel in the earlier part of the program, well, that's Israel too. We're going now to testimonials uh, from Israel and from America, a Jew and a Gentile. The faith of Abel is the same today. Uh, people relate to God in the same ways. And uh, we can show that with modern testimonies. And now back to Israel. This is Kehilat Ma'ayam, one of the many Messianic congregations that assembles every Saturday for praise and worship. They meet here in Israel some 6,000 years after Abel first worshipped the same God of Israel. Worship is vital to these believers as it helps sustain their faith from one difficult week to the next. I think worshiping God, especially before we start service, is very important for me in order to be able to, to really leave everything else behind me and just uh, get to a place where I'm, it's just me with God. Adi Greenman was born in Israel and is a member of this fellowship. She tells how she came to faith in Yeshua, Jesus. My sister became a believer about 15 years ago and when she came back to Israel she told, told us about it and uh, I, was a, I was about eight years old then and it was very hard for me to, to understand what she was talking about but um, I always knew that God exists and I remember myself praying and asking God to show me the truth and if she's wrong to, her, to give me the tools to show her that she's wrong and if she's right, then to show me the way that I need to go. And uh, it took me a few years, but I got to a point where I knew it was true, but I just didn't want to agree with it because I didn't want to give up things in my life. When I was in the army, I was in, um, I had some difficult times and uh, I kind of faced up to what I am and who I am and the way I live my life and I figured out that there is no better time or place in my life for me to come and to give my life to God in, in all, just everything. And I just, um, I just did it. I just said, that's it. I don't want to live according to the world, but according to the Word of God. Never smoked or drank and so it was not a cancer because of something, an abuse of some kind. Debbie Mason is a Gentile believer. Her faith well, in God during a bout with cancer was a matter of life or death. To have a third of my tongue removed, all my lymph nodes removed. Uh, six months later, the cancer reoccurred and I had two thirds of my jaw removed. And then uh, 30 radiation treatments. And uh, at for being so young, they, they had to be very radical about the surgery. So I lost a good bit part of my face. And um, how faith played a part in that, that is probably the most devastating uh, thing that can happen to a person, 
to have a small child, to be young, and to be diagnosed with cancer. So that relationship and that worship that I've always been involved in it was, my, uh, was my rock to stand on. And I knew that it was an attack of the enemy. It wasn't something that God put on me. And it was a test of my faith. You know, a lot of times we, we want to have great faith, but we don't want to get there without being tested. Debbie's husband, yeah, Bob, never... found that his faith and was tested literally. as well. Uh, I don't even know if she remembers it because, again, she was in intensive care recovery and really in and out of consciousness. And she literally wrote on the pad, I'm okay, God's ministering to me. Uh, just pray that my physical body can handle the, uh, the wear and tear on the body and and we just continue to pray and fast and seek God and we just absolutely refuse to accept any uh, any even thoughts of her dying and when the doctors told me after the cancer came back the, the second time they said Bob we cannot save her life I really got to know God you know faith is knowing God uh, every time that the Israelites uh, said Jehovah Roth or Jehovah the shalom. It was because they knew God in some new aspect. And I got to know God as the God who is there. He is always with us. He's, God is the healer. The Word of God is what brings faith to us. Faith comes by hearing. So I saturated myself with scriptures of promise and I kept a journal of all of my promises that God gave me. And through that, my faith level was always high. Despite the doctor's prognosis, Debbie's body is now totally free of cancer. She attributes it to her faith in God. If I could ask what I've done. And broken, I'm so afraid. Day and night I cry to you, my very deepest need. Let me hear your
Well, proper worship is our subject in this program tonight, and uh, Abel is one who got it right. He was one of the first to have a choice, and he brought the right sacrifice. You know, the Lord discussed proper worship one day with a woman of Samaria. In John 4.23, he says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, he told her. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Well, first off, Jesus did claim to be the Messiah. Lately, uh, Jewish uh, reconversion centers, rabbis that, that teach Jews how to confront the missionaries and so on, have been saying Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. These words were put in his mouth by, by Gentile people later and so on. But of course he did. He says, here, I that speak unto thee am he. Uh, and furthermore, the Samaritan woman was someone he chose to reveal himself to. Look who this was. She was a rather mediocre woman. She had, the chapter reveals, five previous husbands. She was now living with a man who was not her husband. Uh, she would not have been the choice of today's church man to go out, perhaps, and, and uh, try to witness to. She should be, because uh, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. It's the sick that need a physician. I'm quoting the Lord. But he actually went through Samaria on this occasion. That was not his usual choice and not the Jewish route from Jerusalem to Galilee. The Samaritans were different people, almost like the Palestinians of today who occupy the West Bank. And so uh, tour buses, uh, Jewish people rather prefer to drive around through the Jordan River Valley or through the Via Maris down the, the road by the sea on the uh, west side down near Tel Aviv to go uh, Galilee to Jerusalem but they rarely ever go over the mountains and through Samaria, and they didn't back then either. But the Lord on this occasion, it's an implication that he went there to meet her, and the people of her town were saved. And that was a, a remarkable benevolence on the part of the Lord, who said, Go not into any city of the Samaritans or the Gentiles, enter ye not, for I am sent only unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, next week we'll uh, take up the subject of Enoch, another early uh, believer who got it right, and uh, it's a fascinating story. Our offer tonight is simply our newsletter, the Levitt Letter. It's very informative. I write some of it myself. We also print articles that are relevant to Israel and prophecy and the things uh, coming up, which, well, may involve the end of the world, so there's no more important subject than that. There's no charge for this. Just send us your name and address and ask for the Levitt Letter. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm.